man like a tree is nourished by his roots. His roots grow in different parts of the world. The branches of his family tree spread out over thousands of years and kilometers. But he considers himself a son of the Kazakh land, the land where the nomads of the Great Steppe reached the highest goals. Arman Umarkojev, traveler, historian, archaeologist in the new season of the Kandala project. On the table in front of me are seemingly simple things, threads, needles and scissors, things everyone is familiar with since childhood. But you should pay closer attention to these threads. They are not simple threads, they are made of gold and silver. Masters of gold embroidery use them to create unique items. So today we will talk about gold work in general and about Zerleo, Kazakh masters of gold work. We won't really be talking about gold embroidery today, but about gold work, if we use scientific terminology. Because according to the International Scientific Classification, all these beautiful things that we're going to talk about today were called gold work. Even if it was made of silver, it's still gold work. But since we're going to talk about Zirleo as part of Kazakh ethnography, then it's certainly appropriate to use the term gold embroidery, because that's what the people call it. Alright, we agreed on the terminology. Gold work itself is a cross-cultural phenomenon. Kazakhs had Zerleo, Crimean Tatars had Mechlama, the Slavic peoples had the facial embroidery, including the Ukrainians, who use the same technique. In our country it's also called the Ukrainian Baroque embroidery. This art form appeared simultaneously in two centers. On the one hand, we know of such a center in the Middle East, the territory of modern Iran and Syria. On the other hand, we know of the Chinese center. And so, at certain stages of human development, the traditions of these centers permeated each other in terms of raw materials, decorative elements, etc., and created a fashion, because for every nation jewelry is always expensive, beautiful, dressy. Tatiana Krupa, historian, archaeologist, head of Umay Margulan Center International Research Laboratory at Pavlodar Pedagogical University, one of the world's leading specialists in the preservation and restoration of antiquities, member of the UK community of costume specialists, Global Heritage Funds expert, member of the European Association of Archaeologists. Aijan, I have a question. How do you create volume when embroidering? This is a very old and ancient piece of embroidery and very beautiful. It always looks very noble. Originally, this technique involved the padding material. Sometimes they used leather and sometimes paper. You cut out a drawing, attach it to the cloth, and then do the embroidery itself. Aijan Abdubai, member of Kazakhstan's Union of Artists, founder of the House of Goldwork. She revives the national art of Zerleo and creates costume collections from museums with the help of reconstructions. Have you ever held in your hands any archaeological goldwork artifacts found in Kazakhstan? The oldest finds of gold threads in Kazakhstan that I have in my lab are from the first centuries AD. 
One artifact is from Janakurgan area, from the excavations of Serik Akhlbek, and the other one was found near Aral Sea by a colleague, an archaeologist from Almaty, Zoldazbek Kurmankulov. This find was important from the Middle East. The majority of important materials, however, came here from another part of the Great Silk Road, from China. There are also a lot of finds of the Golden Horde period, primarily excavated by Timur Smagulov, director of the Margulan Center of Pavlodar University. There are different consumables, but the work was done in the Middle East. It was restored by Krim Altenbeka, a dear colleague and friend, a renowned Kazakh restorer. This is the Middle Eastern silk embroidery and gold work. But what makes this artifact valuable is an embroidered Arabic inscription. I did not look into the Arabic translation, I only saw what I could read myself, I Sultani, and took micro samples of gold threads to study. So there are a lot of such things in Kazakhstan. I, as a person far from any handicraft, let alone gold work, will have difficulty distinguishing handmade from machine-made. And even if someone explains it to me, I doubt I'll understand anything. So, it's better to leave it to the professionals. The difference between handmade and machine-made is determined by the wrong side, because machine embroidery will always have the lock stitch, while you can always see the handmade work. This part shows all the colossal work done. This stuns with its beauty, and this with its complexity. Every European museum has exhibits with samples of gold work. All of these exhibits were once the property of only royalty and clergy. We must not forget that all the items associated with gold work are ceremonial and expensive clothing of the upper class. And if we talk about embroidery specifically with gold threads and specifically with silver as a metal, these are very expensive garments, often belonging to royalty. A lot of them were made in the Middle East, by the way. Byzantium was very fond of exporting such garments to Europe, especially pre-Ottoman Byzantium. Later, the Ottomans adopt this tradition. And today, for example, the Dolma Bakhche Palace has workshops, where the restorers, who came to intern with me at some point, even produce fabrics to restore their exhibits according to the Ottoman techniques of the 15th and 17th century. If you look at the Vatican Museum and those gorgeous robes of priests, you can say that the history of goldwork development is closely related to the history of the development of Christianity and the rise of its status in society. Дело в том, что церковь всегда стремилась, в особенности восточные церкви, которые они всегда любили золотой декор. Что касается музейных, да, экспонатов. The churches, especially the Eastern churches, have always loved the gold decor. As for museum exhibits, people, when they visit a Christian church, they see icons embroidered with gold. I myself embroidered the Metropolitan Bishop's vestment with my own hands in the mid 1990s in the same technique. But there will be a certain distinction. The symbolism will be different. Yes, they were nobles, but this is a piece of folk costume, not a church attire, because the European costume is just different. Talking of European, if we take the last empress of the Tsarist Russia, her famous dress. This was European fashion, but not folk costume. But this dress weighs about 10 kilos, so I've heard. I mean, all the threads, gold and silver, precious stones too. The common folk wouldn't even dream of it. Precisely. They wouldn't even know that things like this existed.
This is a replica of the camisole of Fatima, the favorite wife of Khan Jahangir. She wore this camisole when she attended the coronation of Nicholas I as part of the delegation of Kazakh nobles and danced at the ball. The original was donated by Fatima's descendants to the Central Museum of Kazakhstan. There's an expression in Russian, to pull can you tell. I always thought it meant something so incredibly tedious, such a rigmarole. How does it correspond to the golden threads called канители? Канитель is just part of the gold material that is used for embroidery. If we are speaking of terminology, we have several types of thread here. First of all, all threads, like the ones in the bobbins, are a spun gold. That is, they have a textile base that has a gold metallic thread coiled on it. This is spun gold. It can also have such a structure that it will look beautiful. Look at this leaf here. It's embroidered with two kinds of threads. But when this headdress is on the head of a wearer and the sun shines upon it, it makes the gold shimmer incredibly beautifully, which you can admire endlessly. These are varieties of threads. Here you can also see what is called today sequins. These threads are very diverse. And if we talk, for example, about the Middle Eastern thread, it's just a silk thread which is coiled with about 5 microns thick gold metal. The Chinese, on the other hand, were sly. They took the gut sediment of an animal, on it they rolled out in a special way up to half a micron of metal and, again, wound it on a thread. Interestingly, the Crimean Tatars managed to preserve the name of a spindle with which the thread was spun. In Crimean Tatar language it is called kalostra. The most interesting is that the origin of the term kalostra is Greek. Kalos is Greek for beautiful. These threads, which were used to embroider things in ancient times, were made of metal. You can get at least a kilometer of thread out of a gram of gold. Silver is also malleable, and pulling the thread, i.e. pulling the canitel, is an endless process. And if we're talking about the relation to gold work, then I would link this saying to the aesthetics of gold work. The thing is that people who engage in gold work start from looking at these garments in museums. Then they get into these techniques. I also know how to embroider these things. I'm a textile restorer, so I'm supposed to know that. And you know, it sucks me in this endless thread. And by the way, the thread is also a symbol of destiny, right? The golden thread is a symbol of a rich, expensive destiny, and thus it represents infinity. And the people who pull the thread probably have the nerves of steel. If only, try sitting at the machine with our craftsmen. Try it. Maybe another time. Why do they say pull the canitel? Canitel is made from a particularly thin wire, which is pulled until it is made extremely thin, and it is made into a silver spring, which is then gilded. This piece is the example of canitel goldwork. In Kazakh we say zir. When we say zir, we mean two things at the same time, gold and metal. When we say zirleu, it's not a noun, it's a verb. I heard that Bukhara has its own special school of gold work, and it even reaches some kind of industrial scale. We can take a whole imaginary trip along the Silk Road, because it was the time the trade developed the most. It existed in the territory of Kazakhstan since the 5th century BC, and had several routes, like the step route or the Middle Eastern route. Merchants transported goods along it, each of them carrying most surprising items, things that were not seen in the other country before. 
One of such things was the goldwork fashion, namely Uzbek embroidery. Bukhara style was extremely recognizable. Put a Kazakh Chopin next to a Bukhara Chopin and you will never mistake one for the other. Uzbek work differs from the Kazakh work. Both have their uniqueness. The people put their soul into the works, their own understanding of beauty. Talking about Uzbekistan, we can even trace the time when the gold thread prevailed in gold work and when gold work was silver. If we read the historical sources that describe Emir Timur's palace at Aksaray, they say that he sat on the throne, and the walls behind it were draped with blue fabrics with stars embroidered in gold and silver. Let's look at the excavations of Timur's mausoleum Guri Amir. Timur's coffin was covered with a two-colored cloth. The samples of this cloth are in my lab in Pavlodar. I conducted research on them. It's a yellow and blue fabric with silver embroidery. Speaking of Silva, I wanted to take this opportunity to express my respect to the talented artist and master Aijan Abdubayit, who was able to recreate in the finest detail the very technique of silver thread embroidery of the tomb cover found in the mausoleum of Kodja Akhmed Yasawi. This tomb cover of Hoja Ahmed Yasawi, Khabar Jabkhash in Kazakh, I started it in 2009. It indeed has a silver thread, which allowed us to determine that the mausoleum belonged to Timur's time. Technologically, it correlates with the Golden Horde period. There are publications on the subject. When I saw this cover in the underground chamber, there was a date written, 14th to 18th century. Then, in 2009, I came to Turkestan for the first time to take samples. I had a research grant group at Karazin Kharkiv National University, where I was the head of a department at the time. So, I took samples of the silver threads, and to my surprise, the results showed the exact date. But let me continue talking about the technique. A large publication is being prepared right now on the technique which is described in Klavicho. I translated a fragment of the Feast in the Gardens again because the existing Russian translation does not get it all right. The thing is that it was not gold work. Some of the decor was made using pinned embroidery, but the rest was made in hot couture embroidery, which Klavicho calls Braswold. Now I look at it as an artistic reconstruction, which certainly has tremendous value. But if we talk about the cover itself, it used techniques that are lost today. This is the only cover of Timur's time made in such a technique that cannot be found anywhere else today. But I sincerely hope that with the help of my dear Zerleo colleagues, with the help of Mrs. Abdubayit and her talent, we will be able to restore this technique, because it's even more interesting and complex. Я надеюсь, что мы восстановим и ту технику, потому что она еще интереснее, понимаете? Скажите, пожалуйста. Tell me, please, how did you start studying this carpet? Ко мне обратились с музея Азрет Султан. I was approached by the Azret Sultan Reserve Museum. They had some doubt. Was this really a tombstone cover? Was it really hanging on this stone? I found a piece of cloth like this. It was tucked away as if the Almighty had shown me how the original looked like, because I had to look for silk of the exact color. With this piece, you have to study the ornamentation, you have to understand the style, there's a lot of work to be done. You have to look under all these layers. This is a full-fledged restoration. I saw a documentary about modern Zardozi goldwork in India. It turned out that the great Mughals brought Zardozi art to India in the 13th or 14th century, who in turn learnt it from the Persians. And the most interesting thing is that the art of Zardozi is a strictly male craft, the secrets of which are passed down from generation to generation, from father to son. Women do not work with the thread and the needle in this case. 
женщины не касаются нитки с иголкой в данном случае. Ну, я продолжу вашу мысль. Давайте обратимся... Piling up onto your point, let's turn to the shrine of the Islamic world, the Kaaba. It is covered with cloth embroidered in the goldwork technique, which is also done in workshops in Saudi Arabia exclusively by men. There are many interesting videos on this too. And then, when the pilgrims visit Mecca, when the kiswa is removed, it's cut into pieces and distributed among certain pilgrims, who take it home. I have seen it in collections in Istanbul, in Kazakhstan as well. Not so long ago, a man, a kaza who performed the hajj, brought back a fragment of kiswa. It was made using modern techniques. The tradition of covering the Kaaba in gold work emerged not so long ago. But this is a separate subject. As I understand it, there are many schools of gold work around the world. And so, if you compare the Zerleo school with others, what makes it unique? Kazakh people have their own understanding of beauty, as I said before. Bukhara works can be distinguished from Kazakh embroidery. Some elements of Kazakh decor include the tree of life. Yes, it's symbolism characteristic of this people. Furthermore, the craftswoman will tell you that this Chopin is from this region and that Chopin is from that region. Of course. Because it all differs. The people have been forming their understanding of beauty for thousands of years. Of course, the world and their vision of that world. And they've been inspired by the surrounding world. This is the back of a woman's wedding gown. The composition represents a tree. This glossy, shiny thread is almost as thick as this one. This one is faceted. And this matte one is very thin. The thinner the thread, the harder it is to work with. What historical period was truly a golden age for Zerleo? Taking into consideration the fact that we are making direct parallels with the revival of Zerleo as art, I would say the period of late Kazakh Khanate and the 18th century, which is well represented in Kazakh museums, in particular the National Museum and the Central State Museum of Kazakhstan. At the same time, the same National Museum has garments of the late 19th century but made without gold work. A chapan of a bay stored there belongs to the 19th century. It's made of brocade, and in some places there were attempts, so to speak, of gold work. This is rather an imitation and repair. Although, if we take photographs of the Kazakh nobility, travelers who visited Kazakhstan took plenty, we can see a bey with his wife and the rest of the family. They're sitting in the same kind of chapans and headwear. This is an exact replica of a headgear of a Han called Murakh. The original is kept in the Central Museum. The descendants of Sultan Aishwag by Magambetov donated it there. What a wonderful job! We added a Chopin to the set, taking this pattern as a basis. Somehow, you completely overlooked Saukile, a female wedding headdress, which has never ceased to exist in the life of Kazakhs. It's part of a wedding ceremony. And the two most conservative ceremonies of any nation are the wedding and the funeral. The most consistent. We were invited to celebrate Norris at the National Library of Kazakhstan. I told the ladies who showcased this collection at the library that its history in Kazakhstan stretches thousands of years. What historical period was truly a golden age for Zerleo? If we look at the items presented and the quality of work, you know, I don't know how to express my admiration for the work of the artisans and craftswomen. This is a very hard work. Such embroidery takes a huge amount of time. They have scrupulously studied the originals. These items are restored, not made up. 
although they can create something new too. It can also partly be genetic memory, partly a tribute to the ancestors, maybe some kind of optimistic view of the future.